already, and I'm very glad to introduce the second panel on the blue ecologies. Um, but before I do so, I want to remind everybody that there will be a reception on the second floor at the end of our proceedings today at 4.30, and everybody is welcome to uh, attend that. So we hope to see you there. So the second panel on the blue ecologies um, is especially interesting for me to, um, to me to introduce in the sense, we were just talking at lunch actually with a few of the speakers about um, how the blue ecologies have really emerged in the, very recently in the last few years, seemingly as a, as a very new field and it poses similar questions as were posed this morning about you know, what is unprecedented about all this and to whom, once again, um, I actually remember uh, much before that kind of uh, emergence in academia um, of questions of oceans um, in, in, in the spirit of, uh, of saying from whom one, spe one speaks um, that um, I, I have memories of, in my childhood uh, about being concerned, having an emerging concern about blue ecologies, even though I wouldn't have called them that. I come from Brittany in the northwest of France, and um, the English Channel is one of the most uh, trafficked region in terms of um, naval traffic, in terms of um, commercial uh, ships, and uh, many, many oil spills actually damaged the, uh, the coast of Brittany, and as a kid I have vivid memories of those dark uh, beaches and the birds trapped in the oil. So I think it's been an ongoing um, concern to think with and about the oceans and what kind of interactions human economies have with ocean ecologies um, for quite a while. And it's good to see the vibrancy of academic research on this matter today. So our speakers today are Stacey Olaimo and Bathsheba Bemuth. And um, Stacey Olaimo is a professor of English and distinguished teaching professor at the, at the University of Texas at Arlington, where she served at the academ as the academic co-chair for the President's Sustainability Committee, establishing and directing a cross-disciplinary minor in environmental and sustainability studies and uh, she chaired the inaugural MLA Forum on Eco-Criticism and the Environmental Humanities, served on the international evaluation team for the massive in environmental hum uh, humanities program co competition in Stockholm, was the Wang Distinguished Professor in Residence at GWU, and is currently serving as the co-president of the ASLE, the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment. Alaimo's publications include Undomesticated Ground, Recasting Nature as Feminist Space in 2000, Bodily Natures, Science, Environment, and the Material Se Self, 2000, uh, 2010, which won the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment Book Award for Eco-Criticism, and recently exposed Environmental Politics and Pleasures in Post-Human Times. This is 2016. She co-edited Material Feminisms in 2008 with Susan J. Heckman and the 28th chapter volume Matter in 2016 in the gender series of Macmillan Interdisciplinary Handbooks. And in these occasions, I think uh, Stacey very much has situated herself as one of the leading voices in new materialist feminist theory. Um, she is currently co-editing a new book series, Elements, with Nicole Starosiewski and Courtney Berger for Duke University Press. Alimo has more than 45 scholarly articles and chapters published in, and forthcoming on such topics as sustainability, gender and climate change, queer animals, Anthropocene feminisms, marine science studies, blue humanities, material eco-criticism, and new materialist theory. Her work has been and is being translated into Swedish, Portuguese, Polish, Greek, German, and Korean. She is currently writing 
composing blue ecologies, science, aesthetics, and the creatures of the abyss. And the title of her talk today is Composing Blue Ecologies, Science, Aesthetics, and the Creatures of the Abyss. So you're going to get a snippet of a preview for her next book project, which I'm very excited about. And Bathsheba Bemoth is an environmental historian at the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, as well as in the history department here. Um, and she specializes in the lands and sea and seas of Russian and North American Arctic. Her interest in northern environments and cultures began when she was 18 and moved to the, vill to the village of Old Crow in uh, the Yukon. For over two years, she mushed huskies, hunted caribou, fished for salmon, tracked bears, and otherwise learned to survive in the taiga and tundra. In the years since, she has lived in and studied Arctic communities across Eurasia and North America. From the archive to the dog sled, she is interested in the how the, the histories of peoples ideas, places, and non-human species intersect. Her forthcoming book, uh, which is titled Berengian's Dreams, People, Nature, and the Quest of, for Arctic Energy, is an environmental history of Beringia, the region around the Bering Strait, from 18, the 1840s until um, the 1980s. And the title of her talk today is Whales, Whalers, and Thinking the Ocean Through Cetacean Labor. So thank you very much for welcoming them to this wonderful panel. I'm concerned that the, there's too much lighting in here. Um, so it, could someone turn all the lights off? Since there's all of the sunlight and you won't be able to see the slides very well. So I'm hoping you'll be able to see them. Is it up? OK. Yeah, that'll help. Plus climate change, energy use. Uh, we don't need all these lights on. We don't need any of the lights on, really, um, in this room, I don't think. Yay, there we go. OK. So uh, my first three books are really of one piece. They develop uh, a kind of coherent arc, arcing argument for uh, new materialism and feminist materialism. Uh, one of the concepts is transcorporeality, and there's some, some other things in there. But as I start this book on deep sea ecologies, I have to talk really close to it. Oh, no. That's going to be so awkward. We need it longer. Okay, um, so with the new book, working on uh, deep sea creatures, it's really a, 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 different, a different project altogether, I think, or I'm trying to make it into a different project altogether. So um, if it doesn't come together right away, uh, that could be why. So, <laughs> so I'm working on developing the blue or aquatic humanities, focusing specifically on deep sea creatures who pose particular theoretical problems for the environmental humanities and animal studies. And I shouldn't really even say environmental humanities because really I've been working in eco-cultural studies and environmental science studies for many years, and I don't really see myself as in the humanities in that kind of a way. So I'll put that out there. Um, so some of the problems are that they may only be encountered in extremely mediated ways, entangled with big science and transmitting a rather problematic, universalized global imaginary. Since deep sea species such as jellies or squid cannot be considered companion species, and since nothing is really known about them, especially in ecological terms, or very little, um, they circulate through science and popular culture primarily as stylized, aestheticized creatures. So the book project, which is taking me uh, way too long to finish, Composing Blue Ecologies, Science Aesthetics, and the Creatures of the Abyss, traces how aesthetically rendered deep sea creatures circulate through science, popular culture, and environmental politics from the early 20th to the uh, 21st centuries. And I've used this before, so my apologies to Derek anyway, and maybe to someone else as well. Um, this New Yorker cartoon opens the silent deep, the discovery, ecology, and conservation of the deep seas by marine ecologist Tony Coslow. The caption states, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. 
The middle-aged, middle-class white women, snug in their domestic comforts, inhabit a world unfathomably different from that of the deep seas. The wry contrast between the bottom of the ocean and the arid tea party lightens the woman's confession, excusing her exhausted empathy. But it also suggests that environmentalists have gone too far. How deep must people's sympathies be expected to travel? Taken up by marine ecologist Tony Koslow, however, the cartoon also suggests the serious challenges that face marine biology and ocean conservation. Scientific research and conservation movements require funding and some degree of popular support. And at the start of the 21st century, even the life dwelling in the deep oceans is precarious as it is affected by global systems that swirl together science, economics, aesthetics, ethics, politics, and everyday life. So one of my guiding questions here is what would it mean, what would it take for people to care about life on the ocean floor? In the 1930s, William Beebe and Otis Barton made their historic descents a half mile down into the ocean in their bathysphere. Beebe's bathysphere excursions were crit criticized for being more showmanship than science, as he could not capture dead specimens, but instead described the incredible creatures he witnessed, which the artist Els Bostelman then painted. As the blue humanities develops, the question of how the aesthetic circulates through realms that are subsequently divided into science and art will be essential. From Ernst Haeckel's stunning art forms from nature at the start of the 20th century to the census of marine life at the end of the 20th century, marine biology is saturated with stylized aesthetics that underscore the emergent and provisional practices of scientific and aesthetic modes of capture. Even as the seas, especially the deep seas, are extraordinarily distant from terrestrial life, they may provoke a surreal rather than sublime aesthetic, as well as modes of engagement that do not divide reality and representation, objective science, and subjective art, but instead encourage practices of mediation and speculation that tack between the elusive and the intimate. While Beebe's accounts of deep sea creatures have been critiqued for sensationalism, the sensation here could also be understood as that of an aesthetics of xenophilia or biodiversity, a critique of scientific epistemology, and an ethics of wonder for creatures who elude representation and provoke speculations about creaturely perspectives. Beebe and Bostelman's surreal aesthetics, as well as the self-consciously stylized aesthetic of the census of marine life at the end of the century, work to entice, entangle, and catalyze commitments to include the seas within the terrain of concern. Marianne Cause writes that surrealism aimed above all to preserve a sense of the extraordinary, the unexplained, and the inexplicable. As a quote, art based on desire, it requires a necessary otherness or it withers into boredom. That encounter with otherness allows surrealism, broad, broadly conceived, to be understood as an apt style for an inhumanism, posthumanism, or xenophilia. Much has been written about the importance of sublime in landscape painting, photography, and film, and its importance for the development of American environmentalism. Finnis Dunaway, for example, in Natural Visions, The Power of Images in American Environmental Reform, explains how Herbert Gleason, a landscape photographer and environmental advocate of the progressive era, quote, presented aesthetics as a form of salvation and believed that the protection of natural beauty could restore a sense of transcendence, that nature showed a way to recapture religious emotions in a secularizing culture, unquote. A surrealist aesthetic descends into the depths of this world rather than ascending into another. Indeed, sea creatures have appeared within surrealism, most notably, of course, in Jean Paul Levé's surreal films of sea creatures recently collected as Science is Fiction. And if you haven't seen them, they are spectacular. Everybody should watch this. There's also, there's not only the early surrealist ones, but then there's the um, kind of psychedelic 70s love life of the octopus, which, you know, you just got to watch that. Um, also, in 1936, Salvador Dali donned a diving suit at the International Exhibition of Surrealism, and he created a titillating surreal aquarium funhouse, The Dream of Venus, at the 1939 World's Fair. More interestingly, perhaps, is, uh, and anybody know how to pronounce this in Czech? I do not know Czech. I think that's the language. Okay, so... 
Uh, Stierski's 1934, The Cuttlefish Man, a pink biomorphic shape with a vaginal opening and a long serpentine appendage on a watery blue background, suggests the possibilities for inhumanist surrealisms in which the human psyche is not confined within the individual, but instead the human itself is improperly constituted with a disconcerting, perhaps Darwinist, array of parts that merge human and inhuman, multiplying sex and eluding gender. But Dali, Stursky, and Stursky have nothing on the real star of the surreal seas, else Bostelman. Bostelman, was that my first one? Well, I guess so. Bostelman is a, was a German immigrant to the U.S., and she painted for Beebe's expeditions, sometimes from specimens, and sometimes actually going underwater um, and painting with oils underwater. Um, but also by um, painting for the bathysphere expeditions using Beebe's um, descriptions, his verbal descriptions of what he witnessed when he went down um, a half mile down. Um, National Geographic published more than 300 plates of her deep sea and shore fish and 104 watercolors of sea life, which doesn't even include her work on whales, which Graham Burnett has actually changed the whole narrative of what it was that made whales worth saving, and he attributes this to her uh, pastels. So that's a whole other story about Bostelman uh, with Graham Burnett. Uh, information about her is really difficult to find. There's almost nothing, actually, and I've been in a couple of different archives and, and seen what I can. Um, but then a funny thing happened. Edith Witter, who's a really important marine biologist and conservationist, actually stumbled upon an acquaintance who said, hey, you know, I have a bunch of old fish paintings in a closet in my house my husband's mother or grandmother or some kind of thing. Do you want to come see them sometime? And there they were, a whole bunch of paintings by Bostelman stuck up in, in some uh, closet somewhere. Um, so what's interesting to me here, because I'm looking at how these aesthetics move across science, art, popular culture, is that then Witter has this piece, the fine art of ocean, um, ocean the fine art of exploration about her published in Oceanography Magazine in 2016. So here's a very influential marine biologist who's really interested in Bostelman. So I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. So uh, I spent a bunch of time in the basement of the Bronx Zoo where most of Bostelman's uh, pictures are. Okay, so in this one, I, I think one of the things I like about this, um, this is from Bostelman, is the, the way in which the creatures really dwarf the, um, the little bathysphere and also how the light coming out of the bathysphere doesn't actually catch the creatures. So it seems like this whole critique of the limits of scientific observation and what can be seen. And so there's this oscillation between knowing and unknowing. Um, the viewer is given this perfect perspective to have that sense of oscillation, but the scientists aren't, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I'll just show you a few more pieces by her. This one I think is interesting because it's a little bit anthropomorphized, you could call it, or um, maybe you could say, um, using Franz Duval, that it's critiquing anthropodenial here um, with these fishes with the faces on them. Usually her, her drawings are a lot more scientific and less cartoony, but this one kind of stands out. <clears throat> Bostelman depicts a non-anthropocentric surrealism in the sense of a super-realism or heightened realism which evokes the strangeness of existing entities, not in order to reveal the unconscious human mind or portray human thought, but instead to portray stunning abyssal creatures and provoke thought, perception, sensation beyond the human. And from looking at many of her paintings in the archives, I can say she gave really um, detailed attention to the eyes of the creatures, emphasizing their liveliness and their perspectives. And this is, this is a card I found in the Princeton archives. Um, so this was Beebe's card, and, and it's in the Princeton archives. And he chose this particular work to make his New Year's. He had great, he, they had great parties. I have, I have toasts and everything that they, I, mean, I could go on and on about these archives. but. Um, but you can see in this one, he chooses the one where the fish have the big eyes, which is not only surreal, but of course then it emphasizes the creaturely perspectives, which is actually something he did a lot in his writing, which is kind of surprising for a scientist at that time period to be doing this. So, 
Okay, so she, you could say that she's just merely replicating a surrealist style, but I'd like to argue instead that drawing on the notion of Latour's circulating reference, that some aspects of the creatures themselves are actually affecting their renditions. As uh, Bibi and Bostelman resisted the separation of art and science, sentiment, and rationality that was becoming codified in the early 20th century. She depicts the singularity of these species who dwell at the limits of the known, dramatizing how other worlds, strangely disturbing worlds, somehow exist within this planet. While the deep sea creatures can be made to signify things, they can also speak to an irreducible, non signifying potential that brings the depths into the germane of human concern while acknowledging that their life worlds are untranslatable. And you can see the impact she had um, in this Italian paper. This is kind of uh, just wild and lovely uh, account of it. Um, so Bibi was frustrated that the bathysphere dives did not allow him to capture physical specimens or photographic images, although I did get to see a little bit of, of, of video that was available in an art exhibition um, just very recently. Um, both his dramatic verbal accounts of what he saw through the window and Bostelman's paintings based on his descriptions were deemed too sensational or artistic to be properly scientific. There's something strangely intimate and not at all objective about encountering such elusive creatures in the vast dark seas. By the late 20th century, of course, technologies have made it possible to photographically capture even the ever so elusive giant film on screen giant squid on film with Egypt Witter's team just did. Um, and, okay, and so now too you get lots of reports of this, of various surreal creatures, and so you see this this kind of this trend through the century. Um, so my focus here will be on how the 10 year long massive, in the second half of the talk, 10 year long massive census of marine life, a global scientific effort to identify and count all the creatures in the ocean just think about that for a moment. That was the explicit aim, to count and identify every single creature in the ocean. Um, <laughs> which features uh, highly aestheticized images in its books, films, and websites. So that's the... So in this time of the sixth great extinction, when marine biology is anachronistically discovering an overwhelming number of species in the deep and pelagic seas before they disappear, the census of marine life videos craft an aesthetic that argues for science as a process of making, a more muddled and immersive process that does not divide reality and representation. Let me show you a couple more of these photos, though, from the book first. So the census supported all of these different coffee table books, musical projects, paintings, sculptures, exhibits, on and on, which, again, seems really strange for, a, for this, this kind of gigantic um, scientific endeavor. So as the contemplation of the deep seas is always already a politically charged, scientifically mediated process, partly because of the staggering cost of even the most basic investigations conducted at these depths, it exemplifies Latour's call to, quote, compose the common world from disjointed pieces. The census puts forth a reflexive, mediated scientific aesthetic that foregrounds its endeavors as entangled processes. As an astonishing number of benthic and pelagic species are discovered, it's crucial for ocean conservation that such, quote, discoveries neither glorify individuals as intrepid explorers acting out anachronistic narratives of innocent adventure, think James Cameron, nor that they reduce the species and ecosystems of the seas to genetic raw material for appropriation and engineering, think Craig Venter. Instead, as the unprecedented census and other related uh, projects discover, quantify, taxonomize, and disseminate accounts and images of heretofore unknown creatures, ecosystems, processes, a highly mediated reflexive aesthetics can suggest not only that scientific knowledge is something that must be composed or put together, but that the public, through a sort of post-humanist distribution of the sensible, must admit even the most strange creatures and remote regions of the sea as our terrain of concern. Indeed, as myriad ocean activists, artists, science, and ocean conservation groups continue to demonstrate, humans have already altered the composition of the seas, rising temperatures, melting icebergs, ocean acidification, plastic chemical radiation, and other pollution, massive destructive industrial over 
overfishing and other humanly induced harms demonstrate that the seas often imagined as beyond the reach of human activities and human time are undoubtedly dwelling within the Anthropocene. So I think this is a really strange period of ocean exploration. It's marked by this anachronistic, pro problematically neo-colonialist excitement about the discovery of unexplored territories and heretofore unknown creatures, and at the same time, a 21st century digital stage in which photos, videos, and narratives flow from science, always embedded in economic and political currents, to the screens of citizens and publics. Ranciere's conception of politics is a transformation of space from an empty place of circulation to a, quote, space for the appearance of a subject, seems particularly ripe for post-humanist pirating, and most especially for the open sea, which has long been conceived in industrial capitalism as that of a vast void, an empty transportation surface beyond the space of social relations. That's Steinberg, of course. Um, the websites, photos, videos, and coffee table books produced by the census undertake precisely this sort of transformation. The census works to populate heretofore invisible worlds with new subjects and to reconfigure what will be included in global ecological visions, for example, in this book. The introduction notes that the ocean is out of sight, out of mind for most people, yet the sea is in trouble. Its citizens have no vote in any national or international body, but they are suffering and need to be heard. The very provocation to consider these creatures as citizens engulfs viewers with posthumanist, not necessarily terrestrial modes of political life, challenging us to reconfigure geopolitical parameters so as not to exclude abyssal ecologies. As weird and as anthropocentric as it may be to imagine salps, tube worms, squid, jellyfish, and other pelagic denizens as citizens, such figurations may possibly contest the sense that the sea should remain global capitalism's treasure chest for legal plunder. The census website features a gallery of iconic images new species and other images, framing each image of a creature as if it were a work of art. The digital galleries hearken to earlier times suggesting natural history specimen collections and cabinets of curiosity. Capturing a species through its visual image, even as it glows on the screen, is rather old fashioned, given that genetic barcoding is the preferred method for species identification, especially in the oceans. Um, nevertheless, the captions often note the beauty of the creatures, for example, particularly attractive anemones featuring beautiful stinging tentacles which vary from a vibrant purple to a creamy brown. Some newly discovered creatures that are not as stunning are noted for their strangest, such as the comically glum, gooey, and grotesque beige blob called the fathead. The fact that not every new species discovered is breathtakingly beautiful beg the question of why the census would include this, all of these galleries everywhere, 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 framing the images of newly discovered creatures. Um, since uh, beauty pageant hierarchies have no place in ecology, of course. Um, so what, one of the other things I think about this is that especially for something like this, that I think, I think that it sets up this kind of play between the vast unknowing. It has this black background, and there's just this sort of, you're, you're involved in the process here of, look, you, this, we managed to see this creature, and then it's this valuable thing to be framed, and you sort of go back and forth, and you click on these. I can't do it because their website is, it would take too long to, to get to it, but you click on each of those things. So there's, there's lots and lots of those things that you can click on. Uh, the, the ratio of known to unknown here is encoded in the distribution of space as the orderly catalog or gallery on the left is half the territory of the right, which even though it features one animal, that animal floats within a vast flat wall of unknowing. Even as each animal is clearly delineated as an object of aesthetic appreciation distinct from its watery world, the site encourages its viewers not to view each image in isolation, but as a series tempting us with over a hundred stunning photos. These images could be read in Latour's terms as a set of instructions to reach another one down the line, which you just just means that you can keep clicking on them. And they also talk about here about some of the um, new species that are waiting to be um, described. And so you, you just get this whole sense of the process here. Um, OK. 
Okay, so could this black background, which fails to register ecosystem, which, which, is, a, which is sort of an issue, signifies instead the densely populated space where mediations, the swirl of science, economics, politics, technology, and aesthetics, deliver sea creatures from the ocean at, oceanic depths to labs, scientific journals, computer screens, and coffee table books. If truth is to be found in taking up the task of continuing the flow, this is Latour, of elongating the cascade of mediations one step further, the images pull not only scientists, environmentalists, and policymakers into their currents, but ordinary citizens and activists who find themselves descending into as yet unfathomable ecologies. Okay. So, I can't show this video, unfortunately, because it's not working at the census website, but I'm, I'm just going to read the description and then you can see the, the, a few images of it. Luckily, I have some stills. So this uh, very short video called Deep Sea Creatures dramatically juxtaposes two different styles, the colorful creature floating against the black background and then the imposition of graphics that name the creature, measure it, list its family class, et cetera, or point out features such as the light organs on the jewel squid. Um, icons of measuring sticks and other graphics are briefly pasted onto the moving image. Strangely, the otherwise hypnotic combination of the piano music and the floating, glowing, slowly turning creatures is disrupted by a flash of sound and image, signifying a static interference, the flash of photographic capture, the typing of the text, and the appearance of scientific graphics. While the helmet jelly rotates slowly, a block of text appears and rapidly disappears in the right-hand corner was that a fleeting and tenuous scientific account. These moments break the suspension of disbelief, reminding viewers that these images are not an unmediated window onto the depths of the seas, but highly mediated productions, the fruits of science, technology, scientific, and artistic work. They do not seek to provide the, innocent, the illusion of innocent knowledge, but instead invite the public to the dance of scientific discovery, identification, and production. The stylizations of the census with its frames, grids, and interrupting flashes and captions underscores the networks that interconnect scientists and publics with strange creatures at the bottom of the sea. Perhaps the census is seeking to interpolate a counterpublic, a global audience entangled in 21st century digital consumer technologies who can imagine domains of life that are both unthinkably distant and yet nonetheless zones of immediate concern. We could think of this as parallel to transcorporeal networks, which is what I've written about, but instead of focusing on how substances and material interactions can be traced across vast terrains of differential vulnerabilities and responsibilities, this tracing of mediated imaginaries would pivot on how the aesthetically stylized images transmit something of the nearly unimaginable lives of the creatures of the deep while simultaneously affecting us aesthetically. We tack between immediacy and intimacy of the encounter and the provocation to speculate about creaturely lives and ecologies. If we swim with Richard Grusin's recent work against the current of Western thought and say that, quote, mediation is immediate, then the ethico-political provocations of the encounter with these images are fueled by the mutual saturation of science and aesthetics. So in my recent book, Exposed, I critique uh, Deepesh Chakrabarty's theory of the Anthropocene, along with various visual representations of the Anthropocene that scale up and away, fabricating a transcendent gaze that installs man as a disembodied force who views his effects on the world he has wrought. Um, and also, I have to say that all of these images, too, just uh, erase any kind of creaturely lives or agencies or non-human species. Um, it's really remarkable. Um, so by contrast, the census photos and videos set the stage for creaturely encounters that resist totalizing stable mappings of the globe. Okay, so instead of this, here on the census website, we have, um, if, you, if you click on the globe, that little globe up there, so that is the global vision, obviously, but what you actually get is this little turtle uh, peeking at you, and then this is the whole, um, the obus, the, 
mm, this sort of catalog of all of these creatures. So you actually don't get a global vision. It moves away from that right away. So uh, by extending terrains of environmental concern, however, they may still be implicated in universalized global visions, which are themselves implicated in colonial and capitalist histories. Is it possible to underscore the potential for these images to catalyze ocean conservation movements while at the same time being wary of the fact that as a mode of not just Western, but big Western science, such universalized images may not be consonant with decolonial or indigenous knowledges? Similarly, Latour's concept of compositionism, even as it rejects inanimism and welcomes the distributed agencies of non-humans, still does seem to suggest a standpoint outside the commons, which he creates, um, in which someone is assembling and contemplating the arrangement of these discontinuous pieces. So this unmarked universal subject is, to put it mildly, historically fraught. And to conclude here, um, in a piece called Spatializing Difference Beyond Cosmopolitanism, Rethinking Planetary Futures, Tariq Jazeel argues that, quote, cosmopolitanism may be universal, but it also cannot help but write the world, the planet, in its own terms. He calls for the development of a spatial imagination, quote, that has the capacity to actually step out from the long conceptual, political, and ultimately geographic shadows that cosmopolitanism casts, and to thereby deliver on the concept own promise of living not just with difference, but moreover with radical, heretofore unimaginable difference. So it's not clear to me yet, because I've just started um, thinking about this, whether Jazeel could be, is speaking definitely exclusively about human difference, since unimaginable difference would be difficult to contain within any kind of a category, I think. Um, Moreover, his notion of planetarity seems especially provocative for developing political visions that would extend to the depths. Quote, the effort of planetarity urges continual hard work to keep on decentering ourselves in the face of ungraspable otherness and other worldings. So as with climate change and toxins, most of the threats to ocean ecologies are global in nature. Since ocean acidification, industrialized massive extractive enterprises, and even plastic <laughs> pollution demand some kind of continually composed and recomposed sense of global ecologies, it will be difficult for ocean conservation to gain momentum by appealing to publics without replicating some kind of global visions. And yet, perhaps the surreal and reflexively aesthetic depictions of deep sea creatures from Beebe and Bostelman at the start of the century to the census at the end emphasize more intimate encounters staged within vast realms of unknowing that will perhaps entice people to imagine the deep seas as within the terrain of their concern. And that's it. Thank you. Is this close enough? Okay. I was warned that I need to be close. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for coming, and thank you for sticking through until an afternoon that actually turns out to have been rather lovely outside. It's not even snowing today for the first time in a while. Um, I would like to start this by giving a couple of disclaimers, um, the first of which is that I, like Vera this morning, am a historian, so I have an uneasy or unspecific place in the humanities. And secondly, I was trained as a Soviet and Russian historian, not as an environmental historian. So in some sense, I am an interloper here in every possible way. Um, and my second disclaimer is that um, for the vegetarians and the vegans in the audience, I give advance apologies. Uh, the story that I'm about to tell does involve a certain amount of gore by necessity, um, and I, I simply can't be honest to the story without showing it. And even though I'm a historian, it's a story that I'm going to start in the spring of 2017, um, when a whale that looks something like these 
swam north around St. Lawrence Island, which if you look on the little map is the tiny green dot in the middle of all of those arrows. Um, and the arrows indicate where um, these species of whale, bowhead whales migrate in the North Pacific. And this was a particularly large whale. She was about 60 feet long, weighed between 60 and 70 tons, and she might have been as old as 200 years. And over the course of the lifespan, this whale had been in the, in the work or had done the labor of making the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea, um, kind of north of the Bering Strait, more alive. The work that whales do when they're in the world by surfacing and diving, by emitting plumes of feces into the water, actually makes the entire ocean ecosystem substantially more productive. In particular, they stir up nutrients that phytoplankton require in order to photosynthesize sunlight. And so in places where you have many whales and whales are active, even though they extract massive amounts of energy from the ocean to feed their massive bodies, they actually make the oceans significantly more biologically productive. And even when whales die and sink to the seafloor, they become home to entire hosts of species that are unique, in fact, to the phenomenon of the whale fall, um, which is what biologists have rather poetically started calling this phenomenon. That when they sink to the floor, they sink with them tons of carbon um, and give rise to species that are particular and unique to this phenomenon. Part of the work of whales for the last um, 2,000 years or so has also been to feed human beings. The distant ancestors of the, the indigenous populations that live around the Bering Strait, the Yupik, the Chukchi, um, and the Inupiat are able to make from whales and have been able to make from whales for about um, two millennia permanent settled um, villages in the Arctic and making a settled community that you do not have to move um, in order to find new food resources in an environment that not only doesn't have the capacity for agriculture, but doesn't even have trees you can burn for fuel, is quite a feat. And it's a feat that very much comes from the whales themselves. They were able to feed villages, they provided fuel that people heated their homes with, um, and this remains true now as it did then to, much, uh, to a large degree. So in the summer of 2017, the bowhead whale that I just told you about was killed off the edge of St. Lawrence Island uh, by Chris Apasengok. Chris was 16 years old at the time, and to make the first strike on a bowhead whale that would feed his family and dozens of other families on the island and around northwestern Alaska um, was a moment of enormous pride. The, the village of Gamble, where he lives on St. Lawrence Island, is allowed six strikes on bowhead whales each year by the International Whaling Commission. So even if they do not successfully kill a whale, they're only allowed to attempt six times. And those strikes have a great deal of meaning. It is quite possible in the village of Gamble in the 21st century to go hungry if you don't have enough access to marine resources, in part because food that's imported to the island is so incredibly expensive. Um, when I spend time on the island, I budget $30 to $40 a day to feed myself um, simply because the cost of imported food is so high. And there are times when food simply is not able to come to the island because everything is brought in by airplane um, and airplanes can't land in fog or snow or other weather. And beyond the kind of immediacy of caloric necessity on the island, um, the killing of a whale is a signal within Yupik culture of worthiness. It makes somebody a nekengitach, or a word that very, very crudely can be translated as hunter, but in a more sophisticated sense means a provider or a sustainer, or in fact, a full person. Your capacity to ascend to complete personhood emerges from a relationship with these animals. And it emerges not just in that relationship, but through carrying it out with extreme care and giving great attention to the kind of labor that you're doing in the process of hunting the whale. So in Yupik country, not caring for people is understood in not, as not feeding them, but not caring for whales is understood as withdrawing from any relationship with them at all. To cease hunting is seen as neglecting something that has been deeply important, not just to human beings, but to humans and whales as partners in co-substantiating a relationship for thousands of years. But Chris Apasengok, is 16 years old, he lives in the 21st century. Killing this whale is also a momentous occasion in a young person's life, so he does what many young people would do. He posts news of it on Facebook. 
And Paul Watson uh, finds Chris Apossing-Gox uh, post on Facebook. And Watson is somebody who has also spent his entire life laboring for whales. Um, in the 1970s, he was one of the initial Greenpeace activists who put his body between that of whales and Soviet factory ships off the coast of California. In the 1980s, he suck, snuck into Siberian waters, um, trying to document the use, which he believed to be illegal, um, of gray whales to feed Soviet collective farms, and he narrowly evaded capture by the KGB. And people in Siberia will tell you all sorts of crazy stories about this crazy American who was hanging out in Soviet waters. In the 2000s, he starred in a series called Whale Wars, in which he tracked and then rammed Japanese and Icelandic um, industrial whaling ships in Antarctica for the most part. And by 2017, he was controversial. Greenpeace has formally disowned any um, relationship with Paul Watson very explicitly on their website, but he's also quite popular. And he saw a Pasingok as just another whale killer and described him on Facebook in his own counterpost as, quote, a murdering little bastard, guilted, guilty of snuffing out the life of this unique, self-aware, intelligent, social, sentient being, and goes on essentially to call for a passing gok's death. And within hours, a passing gok is receiving death threats. The justification for calling for the death of a teenager on the internet that most people gave when they sent in these threats was his absolute lack of care for bowhead whales. And not surprisingly, social media descends, as it tends to do, into a complete impasse. On the one hand, you have lovers of whales taking to their barricades, saying that under no circumstances should human beings ever kill them. And on the other hand, indigenous rights activists took to their care barricades, calling on um, the, the sort of privilege of people for disavowing this relationship ever happening. But at the center of it, both Chris Apasengok and Paul Watson invoked a deep, effective bond and a profound relationship with bowhead whales as their reason for making these claims to being able um, to call for one kind of relationship or the other. But their conclusions for what kind of labor is acceptable between people and between cetaceans are diametrically opposed. And what I want to do in the rest of this talk is explore essentially how we got to here through the history of how people have related to whales and then move into kind of a more speculative space than one I usually inhabit as a historian and ask what we might take from the past of humans and whales in order to think about the present and the future relationship of human and non-human worlds. It's a story that I'm going to tell through three groups of whalers, one group of environmentalists, and what we might speculate that we might know about the whales themselves. And I will be doing so quite quickly, so please forgive the inevitable flattening of deep animal, cultural, and historical particularity that is to come. So I'm going to start by talking about the first group of whalers, uh, the Yupik living on St. Lawrence Island. Um, and if you spend time on contemporary St. Lawrence Island, the bones of whales um, and essentially the memorials to the whales themselves are everywhere. To walk on the beach outside people's houses is to know very clearly that death sustains life in this place. And people uses, used to make their houses from the jawbones of whales. They now make their houses from wood that's imported, as you can see from this photograph. But up until the 19th century, most of people's dwelling lives were literally inside the heads of these animals. And for a whale to become a home for a human being, it must first die. And this alludes in some ways to what Vera and uh, Kyle referred to this morning as the need for a meaningful relationship um, with an animal that doesn't, in fact, necessitate degradation or conservation. Um, it's a kind of relationship that's much more quotidian, um, and in fact, people would not, up until quite recently, have interpreted it through either of those lenses. The way that people did interpret their relationship with whales, along with most other things in the universe, was thinking of them not as pieces in a world that's divided between subjects and objects, but as a world entirely populated with different and highly fluid, um, highly temperamental, often extremely fear-inducing um, forms of subject. The hillsides, the walrus, the character of the tides, all these things that were had subjective uh, categories helped people compose their social worlds as long as people did not in turn violate the social worlds um, of these other kinds of beings. 
And cetaceans were therefore just one amongst many kind of non-human person that's inhabiting the, the kind of general UPIC so social universe and is a reciprocating constitutive part of creating social power, um, the material capacity to provide for your families, um, but also a moral and ethical understanding of how people and not people should relate in the world. And whales were in particular understood as having their own country where they lived in social groups with their own culture, their own set of ethical mores, and their own capacity to judge at great distance what people were doing. So in order to successfully hunt a whale, one had to consistently within one's social life perform in a way that whales would judge as they were swimming up from the south or swimming down from the north to be worthy of even interacting with. This involved a whole ceremonial world, much of it performed by women long in advance of whaling boats going out to actually hunt. It involved a series of kind of practices of maintaining cleanliness in the village and honoring any part of the whale that had been killed in advance, such as keeping the bones in places where they are not, um, they're, they're never sort of desecrated. Hunters needed to keep their boats clean and ready. And then once whales were sighted, um, the captain of a particular whaling boat had their own particular song that they would sort of sing out to the whale, um, essentially asking the whale to give themselves up in the hunt. And both in the oral history and in the present practice of Yupik communities that still continue whaling, it is understood that the whales give themselves to hunters very explicitly. And this use of the verb giving is interpreted out of a set of actions that Yupik hunters describe happening quite repeatedly when they encounter bowheads. Which is first the whale will surface on the side of the boat that's opposite the person who is the harpooner, and they will swim alongside at some distance and kind of keep an eye on what's going on. And then they will either dive and swim away and leave, or they will dive and they will swim and come up on the side of the boat where the harpooner is, and they will just simply stay there. And this has become understood in Yupik communities as the signal that this whale has decided that it should die. And their death is interpreted as essentially an act of care between one species to another, between a species that understands that its corporeal reality is capable of sustaining dozens of people for months at a time if it's to die. And from this, there is an interpretation, this is by actually an Inupiat artist, so from a different whaling culture, but quite related, that whales create not only um, the world that they live in, in the underwater world, and there's sort of an acknowledgement of the work that whales do in that space, but that they create the land itself, the physical capacity for human beings to exist at all. Whales bring what the ocean has in so much plenty in an Arctic environment, which is energy, food, and they bring it up into a terrestrial space so that people can continue to live at all. Now, we, of course, cannot actually ask the whales what it is that they are doing in this situation, which is probably the single greatest professional frustration I face on a regular basis. If you can imagine these 200 years old animals who live through the entire modern period that I study as a historian and have been observing humans at close range for this entire time, and yet I cannot go talk to them, and nor can anyone else. But we do know that for at least 2,000 years, whales' experience of humans was essentially this. About 30,000 bowhead whales live in the Bering and the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea. Every year, somewhere between 50 and 100 of them would be killed by indigenous hunters. And every year, some of them would get away from that experience, and some of them would choose to swim past the boat or past the, the hunters. But whales do not seem to have ever changed their migration routes around St. Lawrence Island or some of the other inflection points where people and whales came into contact. But this all changes in 19, or 1848. This is the year where whales in this part of the world become hunted by a different kind of person, uh, specifically by whalers shipping from New Bedford, Massachusetts, some of them from Providence, Rhode Island. And there are commercial whalers who had come all the way into the Pacific, North Pacific because they had simply killed out the accessible whales in the North Atlantic, in the South Atlantic, in the South Pacific, and are basically at the end of the line for the whaling industry. And the first ship into the Bering Sea in 1848 described finding these fields of fat whales um, that yield dozens of barrels of oil each and that have no fear of harpoons. 
whales as one of the captains um, of these initial runs was to describe that seemed to just simply swim up to the boats and offer themselves up to die. But what whalers did with these deaths operated under a very different set of values, an understanding of what a whale was, than the Yupik hunters who were still killing them nearby. The whalers, first of all, did not eat the animals directly. Um, whalers very rarely ate the meat even on the ships. They did not live in houses made out of the bones. And in fact, were there simply to take the oil, um, which is in this case just about the foot and a half of fat that sits on the surface of a bowhead whale, refine it down into something that can be burned in a lamp in New York or Rhode Island, um, and sell it on the commercial market. And to some extent, they were there to harvest baleen, which are the long kind of tooth-like things in a whale's mouth that allow them to strain the ocean, um, which was basically a substitute for plastics uh, prior to uh, the early 20th century. And they did so under conditions where the whalers themselves were only paid for their work as a proportion of the labor, or as a proportion of the sale of the oil and baleen when they got back to port which meant that if you went out on a whaling voyage and you could be gone for 20 or 30 months or more and you didn't kill very many whales, you could get home and get paid a dollar or two for that entire you know, years of your life that you spent under, if anyone has read Moby Dick, fairly demanding conditions. So whalers have every possible incentive to kill every single whale that they come across and turn it into whale oil. But this is not to say that the whalers themselves in this encounter were not aware of certain attributes of the animals that they probably would have had in common with Yupik hunters. They describe the whales as having certain kinds of selfhood. They observe how female whales protected their calves. They spoke often with great pain about having to kill immature whales in order to lure in other whales to come protect them. They frequently read all of the 19th century gender politics onto whale behavior in truly elaborate and flowery prose. But many spoke of the pain that they saw in the whale's eyes. Um, there's, an, there's a particular kind of um, sense of recognition that whalers have in this moment. And they observed very closely how two years after commercial whale ships arrive in the North Pacific, the bowhead whales stopped swimming close to the ships stopped offering themselves up to die, and in fact appear to have learned to retreat into the sea ice um, and use the, the space in which is inaccessible to sailing ships as a defense against being hunted by harpoons. And this is visible across all of the accounts um, of whalers in that period, and is in fact so acute that for four years in the 1850s, the entire Yankee fleet withdraws from the North Pacific out of desperation. They realize that what they have to do is find some way of navigating the sea ice safely or they will never be able to kill whales. Unfortunately for the whales, the, the kind of commercial demands um, and the increasing price for whale oil um, made it so that whalers finally did innovate enough that they're able to navigate around the sea ice and that they were willing to simply take more bodily risks. Um, there are significantly more shipwrecks um, in this period because captains are skirting very close to the edge of the ice in order to be able to hunt at all. And the pace of the killing just increases after this point. It goes from a few hundred whales a year into the thousands. And my sense from reading these logbooks and spending a lot of time from these whalers is that while they very much had a sense both of the destructiveness of their actions and of the canniness of the animals that they were relating to, the intelligence, the, the sense of judgment that they sometimes describe in the whale's eyes, is that these whalers, as members of a sort of capitalist labor system, had no capacity to make legible that experience. The only way that whales were legible as having value in the world they lived in was as commodities. And the only way that commodities mattered was in quantity. So the impetus to whale and whale more and kill more is what motivates most of the, the, the kind of actions on these whaling ships um, and mourning or having a sense of effective relationship with the whales otherwise is relegated to the margins of the whaling logbooks. And as a result, the commercial whaling industry kills down the number of bowhead whales in the North Pacific until they're almost gone. The result was a series of profound uh, famines among the Yupik and other indigenous peoples along the edge of the, along the Bering Sea coast who simply had no access to food. 
And at the same time, it clearly rearranged quite fundamentally the ecological relationships in the Bering and the Chukchi and the Beaufort Seas. All of that work that whales were doing is suddenly absent. It's very likely that some of the species that feed on whale falls go extinct after the end of the Yankee whaling period simply because there weren't enough whales dying anymore after this massive conflagration uh, to sustain these species in any number. And it clearly rearranges the relationship between human beings and whales in terms of what whales were expecting of humans, um, and to some degree, what kind of relationship you pick people could still carry out with whales simply because there were so few. So in some sense, that you could say that the, the beginning of the Anthropocene, um, if you mark the Anthropocene as a moment of profound rearrangement um, in ecological life and in the relationship between humans and the earth, um, for bowhead whales starts in the 19th century. But it would also continue as a 20th century phenomenon. Within a few centuries, or sorry, a few decades um, of the capitalist whaling ending, a new kind of ideological hunter enters the North Pacific. And these were the factory ships that were run by the Soviet Union. And unlike the Yankee whaling ships, who by kind of their technological limits of using sail were limited to not killing every single species of whale because they had to be slow enough um, and they had to be approachable under certain kinds of conditions, the industrial factory ships that the Soviet Union ran could kill basically anywhere, any whale anywhere at any time of day and would frequently, in fact, kill whales 24 hours a day um, with highly uh, sort of technologically sophisticated tools. They would track them in advance with helicopters um, and had fleets of catcher boats um, that ran like factories basically around the clock. And the Soviets, of course, are not killing whales to sell them. They're killing them to have them function as part of an economy that in fact rejects the idea of sale quite, and critiques it quite seriously. They're not thinking of them as commodities in a typical capitalist sense. And here I'm going to collapse the research from months of my life spent in what was in fact the coldest archive on the planet, I think, into a very brief paragraph <laughs> and description of sort of what the motives of these Soviet whalers were. I think we're more familiar with the kind of motivations that come behind the capitalist whaling where it is simply to be able to earn a wage and feed your family under rather, really, relatively dire circumstances. But the Soviet archives are filled with a different kind of obsession, where the capitalist you know, desire to fill the hold and go sell whale oil when you got back home led to very elaborate bookkeeping practices. The Soviets make these bookkeeping practices look absolutely immature. They are deeply committed to counting whales because every time you killed a whale, you got to say that you had filled part of the communist production plan. And the plan is a document that is um, given out every year by Gosplan, kind of the head planning commission in Moscow, and it's supposed to uh, fit into part of a five-year plan that is developed um, by the communist leadership. The first five-year plan is initiated by Joseph Stalin and comes with sort of a massive rush of communist um, sort of overconfident building and everything else, but these plans are still being used after the Second World War. And the notable thing about the plan is that every one that is released is supposed to be bigger than the one that came before. Every five-year plan is supposed to take what you did in the previous five years and make it better. And it's supposed to do so because making more, increasing production, is one of the few tangible things that the Soviet Union seemed to have found for indicating that they were actually making communism happen. There is a real problem when your vision of utopia, as outlined by Marx, gets fuzzy on the details of what it's supposed to look like when it actually exists on the ground. And this kind of grounding in numerical plan making, in killing a whale and then dividing it into every different possible thing you could make it out of use, dividing that by how much you killed last year, multiplying that by what you might be able to get next year, is a way of sort of quantifying a practice um, of substantiating utopia. And whales, it turns out, are a really good way to do this because Soviet technology allows them to not just fill the plans every year, but wildly overfill them at first. So on these Soviet ships, there is a sense that in some ways people feel like they're actually participating in real existing socialism. But at the same time, the Soviet whalers are 
witnessing the same things that Yupik whalers and that capitalist whalers saw, which is that these are intelligent animals responding to people's um, motives, responding to how people interact with them on the ground. And they saw whales exhibit the same kinds of learning behavior in the sense of seeing ships, learning to avoid them, learning to try to protect immature animals and move them away. And in fact, Soviet marine biologists who spent a lot of time working directly on these whaling ships with Soviet whalers are far ahead of marine biologists in the United States in terms of understanding the sociability and the communicative capacity of whales. Um, it's something that the sort of individualist model of American understanding in the world in some ways clouded the degree to which um, whales are quite social and it's something that marine biologists in the Soviet Union are, are somewhat readier to, to latch onto. But as in the United States, the experience of whalers and their sense of being part of an affective relationship with these animals is one that is similarly illegible to the five-year plan in the Soviet Union. It's no easier to sort of force that relationship into the public view to make people take it seriously as a Soviet whaler than it was as a capitalist whaler in the 19th century. And thus the work of these marine biologists who go out and document what they're seeing and are worried in a very kind of acute way about the crisis that they see coming with whale populations, they write up reports, they send them back to Gosplan. Um, and as one Soviet marine biologist described to me, Gosplan would tie them up with string, stamp them as classified, and throw them in an archive. So capitalist and communist whaling to me seem to have two things in common. The whalers themselves did not operate in a world that let them act with any sense of care or any type of relationship other than extraction with the animals they were trying to kill. There was no official way to value a whale alive, in, essentially. The values that both groups of people followed officially and the values that would remunerate them in a material sense were set by distant people, either by consumers in, in the east coast of the United States in the 19th century, or by Gosplan in Moscow. And I would hardly be the first historian to diagnose the problem of commodification, the idea that you separate production from consumption in a way um, that, that causes a whole series of kind of social and cultural effects in the breach. But in that relationship in this case, I see the denial both of the labor and knowledge of the whalers and of the whales themselves because the story of whales responding to both capitalist and communist hunting is completely written out of the archival account. So in some ways, the words for this might be dehumanized labor in the fact that the whalers are not able to express the actual relationships that they imagine they might want to have with these animals um, and receive social value for it. But it's, in fact, more than that. It's labor that is stripped of any formal way of recognizing the non-human as well. And the second thing that these forms of knowledge or forms of whaling seem to have in common with each other is that they both fed dreams of endless growth. And I think that at some, both the capitalist sense that you should keep producing more and more commodities for a market of people who want to consume more and more over time, and the Soviet obsession with filling plans that grow more and more year after year as a way of acknowledging a utopia that no one really knows what it looks like, but it still should be arriving any day, is that both of them fundamentally reject death. That the, the linear lines of progress going forward into the future and an endless line of growth ever upward are not bound by the cyclical ways that time works in cycles of birth and death, but instead offer a teleology of freedom and a freedom that is based first and foremost in becoming liberated from the whims and wants of nature. The first thing you have to overcome is that, the way that you overcome the whims and wants of nature is you produce more from it under terms that humans and only humans want, and then you can just keep growing. Now, of course, that line, the production line going up for the plan or for the numbers of barrels coming into the New Bedford Harbor is fed, in essence, by entropy. It's fed by death at the source. And those entropic acts killed through entire oceans. They robbed whales of their fellow whales and they robbed the oceans of the work that whales do within them, which fundamentally changed the ecology of these seas. And this makes whaling mostly like dozens of other economic activities that are based first on death, but then through the process of moving that death far away from the people consuming it, 
make it completely invisible at the end of the line where we are its beneficiaries. So now enter Paul Watson. He was a very early member of Greenpeace, which starts as an anti-nuclear organization. And it ceases to be an anti-nuclear organization and turns to Wales when Greenpeace members learn that the United States and the Soviet Union are both lubricating the heads of their intercontinental ballistic missiles with sperm whale oil because it's the oil with the lowest friction point on Earth. So in order to save humanity, in some sense, people decide they need to start by saving whales. And in 1957, or 75, sorry, they tracked, with the help of the Department of Defense, a Soviet whaler off the coast of California and shot footage of the whaler, whaling ships um, going after a pod of sperm whales. Um, and Watson sat on the back of one of these whales as it died. And his mission, you might argue, was exposing death and making it public, to re-inscribe that process of entropy into a way of understanding whales that had more or less banished it. And you might say that this is a necessary function, and I would probably agree. Because by the time that Greenpeace activists took to the sea to protect whales from Soviet whaling ships, the dominant mode of human engagement with such species was, outside of small whaling communities in the northwestern Arctic and in parts of Canada, generally speaking, one of extraction. This was starting to change on land, um, where people didn't have a direct relationship with whales, as culturally they're starting to transform into much more meaningful animals. Um, and this is also kind of informing how Greenpeace is operating. But for the people who directly relate to whales at this point in the 20th century, they're either a small number of indigenous whalers or they're on these Soviet factory ships. And Greenpeace and Watson, as a member of Greenpeace at the time, wanted to assert the value of a living animal um, to the public by making their deaths public and making those deaths as terrible as possible. But Watson goes a step further and concludes that humans should stop killing all whales anywhere by anyone at any time, which is what brings us back to St. Lawrence Island in the summer of 2017. And if I liked Paul Watson more, and if he was not in the business of threatening teenagers that I know, I might here have to step in and apologize to him for the fact that I have made him stand in for an entire worldview. But it's a worldview that I think still is fundamentally underlying much of the way that people choose to relate to the environment in an environmentalist mode at the moment. He is an extreme version of it, um, and far more extreme than most people in this room would be comfortable with. But at the end of the day, the understanding of whales that Watson participates in still maintains a hard line between what is a person and what people can do and what is a not person and what they need protected from. And in some sense, the politics of Watson's attack on Chris Apasengok is the inverted politics of industrial production. If industry can only see whales as valuable when dead, then the answer is simply to invert that and see the value of whales only when they're alive. And it's an argument that means that people should fundamentally withdraw in most ways from having any kind of relationship. And it is an argument that calls for renouncing death, not the sort of industrial empathy that's produced by these whaling ships, but the death of whales under any circumstances. And Watson, in some ways, can't be blamed for this. He is an inheritor of practices um, that we all, in some sense, share in this room of ignoring entropy, either by separating consumption from production or by imagining that we are above consuming at all, which is, in some ways, another way of imagining that humans live in a state of exception from the rest of nature and from the agency that grants us a particular kind of freedom to create or to destroy. And a kind of freedom that means that human beings alone are capable of creating ethics. But to live in the Arctic, as I have spent some time, um, as Claire indicated, is to understand the complete inevitability of entropy and to understand that freedoms are deeply curtailed. To walk out your door in the morning in the Arctic is to understand that you may not walk back in your particular bodily form, partly because we're just simply not at the top of the food chain. You're not at the top of a food chain with a 30 6 rifle and good aim, and you're also not in control of thousands of other natural factors that may or may not allow you to continue being a person. 
So to walk out in the morning is to recognize your personal dependence on the persons of others and the decisions that they are making for you. Perhaps I will be their food, and perhaps they will be mine. So it is also a world that where in order to be alive is to be participant in death. It's a place that is impossible to retreat to the comforts of eating vegetation because there simply aren't enough of them to eat. If you want to be a person alive in the Arctic, something somewhere must die. But in the Anthropocene, here in Providence, even in a life lived without ever touching animal flesh, something somewhere is dying on our behalf. And in fact, many somethings are dying. Our way of life, if we're sitting in this room, is participant in extinction at a fundamental and mass level. An extinction is not just an individual death, as terrible as that may be, but is actual species annihilation. So consumption at a distance is no longer feeding on whales directly, but it does feed on other things, and it does so at a scale that makes Watson's comfortable with desire to withdraw from the world look both comfortable and somewhat naive. And naive in the sense that there is not a possibility of re with retreat or withdrawal from consuming the world that we live in. The only beings that get to not consume are those that are photosynthetic and can actually turn sunlight into carbon. The rest of us are cursed with choosing how we're going to relate to the world by eating part of it. One of the many intellectual challenges of the Anthropocene, I think, to my mind, requires learning how to articulate this ethics of dependency to recognize that the labor that is done by other beings in this world is as constituent of our lives um, as our own work. And that some of that labor is in caring and in offering human workers the capacity to do so and express in their workplaces the full range of feelings and affect that they actually come in contact with. And some of it is in accepting that the decisions of other creatures are in fact caring for us. Which perhaps, and here's where I get speculative, is what whales have been doing in the Arctic for thousands of years by choosing to die. If we take seriously the knowledge of Yupik hunters and the knowledge of other whale hunters who saw whales reject them once they entered the Arctic with industrial capacity, and if we take to the work of contemporary marine biologists seriously who emphasize the degree to which whales are social communicative beings with their own culture and their own rules for conducting their lives that are handed down across generations, then what we might see in whales um, are animals that have done their best to reject certain kinds of relationships and to continue other kinds of relationships into the present and to continue them by choosing to die for people. And to speculate very wildly, the whales themselves have offered an argument for the kind of relationship they would prefer. It is a relationship that requires that humans remain dependent and surrender in some sense to what the animal expects of care. It's also a set of actions, I think, to close the calls for historians to pick out different kinds of signals from amongst those freezing archives where we spend time, to look for places where there are other examples like those of the whales that look beyond humans for examples of how ethical relationships have been made in the past. Thank you. Thank you so much for two incredible presentations and thought-provoking ones. I have so many questions, but maybe we can start with questions from the audience if anyone has one. Just Yeah, Amanda. Oh, sure. Thanks for those two um, fabulous papers. Um, I'm still, I'm just, you blew me away. Uh, Bathsheba, and so thank you so much for speaking today, especially on short notice. Um, uh, my question is, is, is for Stacy, but it builds on something from uh, Bathsheba's uh, talk. So I was really struck uh, with your conclusion and um, with the, the uh, contrast between um, the uh, appeal to the surreal and aesthetically reflexive presentation of the deep sea creatures as possibly um, helping, let me see, 
helping people to imagine deep sea creatures as within the terrain of their potential concern. I think that was like your last sentence. Um, and I was struck by the sound, by, by the pragmatic sound or strategic sound of that, of that very last sentence. Um, and it also led me to think about what the relationship was between what you had to say about science and what you had to say about this sort of aesthetic form or this aesthetic appeal. And um, I mean, just one of the very last things that Bathsheba said about marine biologists understanding the social lives of whales or understanding sort of whale culture m made me wonder, and, and, and admittedly, a lot of what I was inferring from your, your, your presentation about science had to do with the, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the artist. Uh, yeah, yes. and the really, you know, and the critique, the implicit critique of science through there. But it was also it was also implied in your discussion of the problem of a distanced view, mm -hmm. right? An objective distanced view. Um, and so I just kind of wondered, first of all, whether in fact you're taking some distance from the aesthetic when you talk about it strategically at the end or not. Mm -hmm. And um, also, what your whether you see science as playing a role in helping us also to be prompted to concern um, mm -hmm. in the way that just that one reference to marine biology mm -hmm. suggested in Bathsheba's talk. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think the science is. is I mean, that's really all we have with uh, deep sea creatures is the science. There's no. You can't go to say. Um, long cultural traditions or indigenous traditions because the deep, the deep sea is really, really deep and you need a lot of money and a lot of high tech equipment to get there. So what I'm trying to get at is this way in which um, very um, aesthetically saturated scientific mediations can provide this kind of intimacy or immediacy because of course the, 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 the biggest challenge to kind of uh, including the ocean in, especially the deep areas in uh, conservation, is that sense that it's so far away and what do you do with it? And I, I purposefully in my book am not talking about cetaceans because there's so much about cetaceans, so I'm only looking at these kind of weird creatures. And so when you talk about the social lives of whales, um, you know, or dolphins, there's so much written about that. And so I'm not at all doing that. And so the reason then is that these other creatures, the only thing we really have of them is the aesthetic, and one of the things that fascinates me too is that some of the scientists, even when you watch these films of the scientists finding some of the, the creatures, they have the same reaction that we would, which is, holy crap, or wow, cool, beautiful. It's because there's not that much, and there's not, um, very little known about the ecosystems, et cetera, so I'm just, it's, um, I don't know if that answers it, but the, uh, the idea of it being, Strategic, um, I mean, I guess that's the cultural studies person in me, you know, I mean, I can't, I, I, I am an environmentalist, I've always been an environmentalist, and so I do think things through in terms of what, what sort of works strategically, and, and I look a lot at, at um, how, at theoretical questions that cross with political activism and, and how all of that kind of gets, Entangled, so that that is definitely um, what I'm looking at. So, In the back. so um, Thank my question's for Beth Sheba. Uh, that, first of all, I just want to say that was one of the most deeply affecting talks I've heard in a very long time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> um, I, I guess the, the way I'm going to phrase the question is this: um, We. You, you, in, in pointing to the connection between communist and capitalist models of extractive exploitation, um, you, you focused in on the, the sort of the linearity of that approach that, and, and the rejection of death that that implies at a kind of metaphorical level. Um, we, uh, we, we could think of all sorts of ways in which death is rejected by our looking to our legacies, look, writing books, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so I guess the question that I wanted to put up, because it sort of reflects on something that Kyle said in the earlier panel, um, about sort of models of linear time versus circular time. Um, and in, in what you've proposed, it sounds like you are situating the Ubik people and the whales in a more circular model of time. 
that we should be learning from. And yet your argument is grounded very much in a historical model of linear development. And the only reason I ask, and I, do, I really don't mean this as a corrective because I, I, I find the talk deeply um, um, persuasive, but as a, as a scholar of China who's come from a tradition that spent the last 50 years pushing back against the efforts of Western historians to understand China as belonging to a circular mode, circular mode as opposed to a linear mode of time. I, I, I wonder how we should grapple as historians with that otherness. If, if that's really an otherness, if there is another model of temporality that they have that, that, that you've encountered. And that's, that's, sort of, that's the question I'm asking. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's one, as a historian who writes in the form that historians write in, which is narratives that have beginnings and middles and ends, um, and therefore you're, you're stuck with linearity just in kind of a physical sense when what you write are books. Um, it's something I think about a lot. Um, and in typical historian fashion, I think what I would probably say is that the answer to the question is both, that time is in some sense needs to be understood both as linear in the sense that things do change, things do disappear or appear in geologic timescales, they do in evolutionary ones and they do in historical ones. But at the same time, the the day-to-day -day lived experience of being a human is also fundamentally structured by a cycle in which we are born, we mature, we probably have our own children and then we die. And that that's a cyclical one that is happening within both sort of human timescales and within every other living organism other than some trees that just kind of keep going for 10,000 years. But um, you know, maybe in their worldview, it's also cyclical. The cycles are just really long. Um, and that it's, some of it is just being comfortable moving between scales at which some of the scales are in fact relatively linear and some of the scales are in fact deeply cyclical. And what I see both capitalism and communism trying to do in the sort of lived material worlds they're attempting to build is to reject the cyclicalness of human lifespans, basically. Um, and with that, they reject and are relatively um, they don't have a very good way of dealing with other kinds of cyclical time and other species um, or ecological events that are also cyclical. Um, and I think the Soviet Union is in some ways the most extreme example of this because it's a political project that lasts for a human lifetime. It is literally unable to deal with the inevitability of death. When the first Soviet generation starts to die, so does the entire project. Um, and I think that it's, it's so committed to its ideology, the fact that it can't outlive the human time span is in fact indicative of processes that also exist in capitalism, but we cover them up with other things. Can I just add to that, that um, at one point in your talk you, you evoked this, the, the convergence of the Soviet um, denial of cyclical time and the capitalist one um, in the form of growth and productivism, etc., as one of a te teleology of becoming emancipated from the terms of nature, I think, I think you said. And um, this very much resonated with me in part because I work on these issues, right? And, and um, um, but, you know, one thing that I would want to ask you about is actually something that Amanda pushed me on for my research, which is, isn't, the ca isn't it the case also that these utopian teleologies are also anti-telic in the sense that they deny a, a sense of purposeness to one's death, right? And all these little purposes that nature deploys are actually, you know, it's, it's, it's just a goalessness in a way, um, th this logic of growth. It's growth for its own sake and therefore it's mm -hmm. in a way the abolition of telos rather than a teleologic logic. Does that make sense or would that appeal to, am I right to think in that way as well or? I think that you're, you're right in the sense that there is um, and I think everyone who's worked a terrible day job or many former Soviet citizens I've spoken to um, whose job it is to just produce more of things understand this to be stripping away other places in which human cultures tend to be quite sophisticated at creating other forms of meaning um, and that and I think that, again, the Soviet system is an extreme version of this that in some ways is helpful to use as a reflector back on how we live in that, um, in, in kind of capitalist terms, because they wanted to do away with other forms of meaning making. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the United States, for example, generally speaking, outsources much of its meaning making to religious organizations. And so you're allowed to kind of go through those rituals of birth and death and 
things like that. You just do so outside of the productive space and you do so outside of the political space. And the Soviet Union, because it wanted all of those things to be housed under this radical revolutionary politics, had a really hard time dealing with weddings and births and funeral. I mean, the, the state spent endless amounts of time trying to figure out what to do with funerals. Um, because, of course, you couldn't have orthodox funerals and you couldn't have synagogues operating, but then what do you do? Um, and so I think they were openly dealing with the emptiness of endless production in some sense. Yeah. I have a question about the end of your talk, because I thought, I thought your paper was really, really fascinating and the research that you did was really amazing. At, at the end, though, I guess, one of these perpetual questions that comes up for me is to the extent to which you, if you are not within an indigenous culture, and really in that specific indigenous culture, that you can sort of scale that up to other ethical modes or ways of being. Because of course, the idea of the labor of the creatures and that this idea that the decision of other creatures that came for us by choosing to die, I can't, I can't take that out of a UPIC context and generalize it to people eating meat from factory farms. I mean, I don't think that most people in industrialized countries who are eating meat from animals who I just don't believe they have chosen to die in a, or live in a factory farm for that matter their entire life. How, I mean, how can, how can that conclusion actually fit for people who aren't UPIC? That's a good question and I don't, I, I would not want to be taken for wanting to sort of romanticize an experience that is particular to this, this place and time and to a long cultural patrimony that I do not share and nor does anyone in this room. Um, but I think that what's important to me, both in, in how you big people understand whaling, but also in what you find in the experience of whalers working on these commercial vessels is that if those people, much like people working in factory farms, um, and I'm from Iowa, so, the factory farms are everywhere. Those are people who do understand themselves to be participant in a terrible thing, right? Mm -hmm. And that if we were listening to their labor experience as part of our own politics, we would also reject eating meat out of the factory farm, mm -hmm. um, much as if we had been able to listen to the experience of people on whaling ships, there would have been, I think, a different political sense. Um, mm -hmm. Because there is no sense in which those animals are choosing to die, and there's no sense in which the people who are involved in that labor don't know that. Um, and don't know that it's terrible. Mm -hmm. So I think some of it is a blindness, not just to animal experiences, but a blindness to an entire category of human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, my, my sort of personal ethical stance on this is that if I am not personally willing to be involved in the death of it, I don't mm -hmm. think I should eat it. Like that should be the, and then if I am not personally invested in understanding how that came to be, and if I didn't think it was good, mm -hmm. then, you know, then I won't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are different ways to draw that line, but I think being attentive to all of the human experiences also that are participant in production mm -hmm. is a thing that we have gotten quite bad at doing. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take another five, 10 minutes and have a shorter break. Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, my, my comments are for Bathsheba. Um, great paper and I'm still processing it. Um, but I wanted, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, something that actually Stacy's question raised for me, uh, I was thinking about it during the course of your presentation as well, which is um, you describe very carefully the demeanor of the actual workers that are in those uh, uh, factory boats and in the middle of the 19th century, uh, the Yankee whalers versus the Soviet whalers. And um, you refuse to uh, judge them. You are trying to assess them in their, in their, own, their own understanding of what it is that they're doing. And um, so a couple of things about that. First is that um, it struck me the, con the, the contrast between the behavior of the villagers that you were examining um, together with the actual workers in those different whaling enterprises. The difference between that and the uh, behavior that Branka was describing yesterday when she was talking about clubbing of flightless animals seems very different. And so I became curious about what you thought was the underlying logic of the, why that difference? Why that difference in the uh, form of human relationship to 
uh, animals. Um, does it have anything to do that the animals uh, that we're talking about in this case are mammals um, mm -hmm. and the other ones are not? Uh, or, or, what, or is it something that um, is on the human side that they are uh, uh, part of different, um, different modes of production in some ways? And uh, so, so that, that's one thing. And the other, the other thing is that um, you're actually talking, that your talk suggested to me is that part of the problematics that you, the underlying problematics that you are discussing have to do with the alienation of the product of labor, as well as the alienation of labor itself. The, the rendering meaningless what labor is, because you have no contact with that with which you're producing. So I wonder if that might be an element in the underlying logic. Um, yeah, and, and then I, I was trying to see why the, there was stuff going on in my head um, when you were speaking and I, I, about the commonalities between the capitalist and the so-called communist uh, regimes of uh, uh, economic functioning. And I, I was trying to remember, it's Ken Pomerantz's um, articulation of the developmentalist project yeah. being common mm -hmm. to both right. and mm -hmm. being born yeah. out of liberalism in the 19th century, or actually from the Enlightenment. Anyway, the, the, that, that was just a comment. The questions came ahead. Now I'm going to have to go back and <laughs> remember. Um, you're completely right in diagnosing the underlying Marxist stuff going on here. I, mean, I think most Soviet historians have to do some hard time with Marx to begin with. Um, and I do think that there's something useful in thinking about nature is a thing that people know through labor, and therefore the way labor is constructed and the way people relate to that process is also going to be fundamental to how they know the, the world around them. Um, the, the birds versus, yeah. I, I think that the, the kind of moral imagination for large intelligent mammals that seem to spend lots of time with their young is, is pretty critical here. I think the fact that um, whalers had a very had a very easy time kind of transporting models of the nuclear family onto what they saw was helpful in creating an affective sense. Um, but there's, I think also there was this kind of sense that whales and people were in it together because the the job was terrible. Um, it was dangerous. Whales sometimes killed people. People mostly killed whales. Um, but whalers' vocabularies, particularly the English-speaking vocabularies, have all of these weird moments of convergence, like the the word for a group of whales before we started calling it a pod was a gam, um, but when a group of whale ships got together, they called it gamming. Um, so they, they considered these to be the same activities and they, they drew the human activity from what the whales were doing. And there's some other examples of that in just sort of the vernacular um, that, that to me indicate a kind of thinking along these lines that I think is aided by the fact that they're mammals, honestly. One last question. I hate to say that because this is such a rich conversation, Sharon. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is, in a way, kind of for both of you, but it starts with Bathsheba. Um, so, uh, so thinking about the moral imagination um, that is behind the lens that sees the whales as giving themselves to people. Um, so on the one hand, I, I, I see that, more, that moral imagination, I can, I can see that telling of the story as, as plausible. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's a part of me that says, well, isn't that just a rationalization, a human rationalization for, you know, to justify what is a legitimate human need? And then I, um, after having that thought, I thought, well, does it matter? You know, does it, does it matter? Because um, there's a sustainability to the relationship that that moral imagination allows. And it's, you know, it's better for the people. The people aren't dehumanized in the ways that you've described through the factory building. And the, the whales, you know, more of them get to live. And then the sea ecology, it's better for the sea ecology. And so, um, so, uh, th and then I was thinking about what kind of where Stacy ended with, um, which was kind of like pushing us to th think about new moral imaginations of deep sea creatures that can be generated through these 
aesthetic representations and so on. Uh, so I guess, it, I don't know, I guess I just wanted to ask the two of you to maybe just say something about moral imagination in the context of relationships between the human and the non-human. So, sorry, it's well, vague. I, I mean, I think, we, I think we cross at a point in this idea of the global or the universalized perspective, right? So the, the, the place at which I'm, you know, feeling this sort of cautionary tale about the end of, of, of her very beautiful paper is this idea that uh, how, how other people could take that up. People who are not you but could take that up as, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna adopt this spirituality and feel like all of these animals are giving themselves to me and I'm part of the world and I'm not one of these environmentalists that thinks that they're not part of the world. I mean, it's just such a, and people do this. I mean, you know, this is, this is a thing. So, um, so you know, that, that's, I think that's just so, so problematic. And then, so, so I really do think that, that I'm not gonna judge Yupik culture in their, terms of their moral imagination, but I would sort of say, it, is, it should not be sort of universalized to people who are not practicing those things. So my, my whole new materialist sense and transcorporeality, all of that is, is really against any kind of transcendent view or the spiritual versus the material. And so, I mean, you're being very careful about talking about practice and labor, which, which melds everything together. And of course, indigenous traditions don't have this Western divide, but in the West, you know, because we've had this long divide um, between uh, the material and the spiritual, people just think they can adopt any kind of spiritual thing, and then that's where all of these ethical problems come up. But so in my in my pers in my project, I have the opposite problem, which is because it's big science and it's Western science, it's the, the vision of some of these creatures, even as it's kind of intimate and surreal, I mean, that, that's what pushes against it. What always bothers me about this project that I'm doing is that it's, I can't really incorporate any kind of decolonial or indigenous or even, I can sort of have them on the horizon as a critique and I can tr critique the universalized vision and the perspective of the universalized vision. But, it, but the deep sea ecologies are a global big science project. So a lot, of, a lot of what I look at, what I've been looking at for many years, um, starting with feminist epistemologies and then environmental epistemologies, is the ways that epistemology and ontology and ethics and politics are all very situated and how we negotiate that and then how we trace or capture long lines of material interactions and agencies that are to me very deeply ethical and political and that's how, that's how, to me that's how environmentalism really changes the whole landscape of what is ethical and political, is, is looking at all of those, the long lines of material interactions through things. So. Yeah, I think in many ways my, my answer will, will piggyback on what Stacy is saying in that um, I think that the moral imagination that I see, the, important in this story that's coming from the Yupik is important because it's specific to that place and it is important because it's based um, on specific interactions that have been observed over long periods of time and yes those have been interpreted by people um, but the origins of those actions are with the whales themselves um, and so in fact it's not a it's not an exportable model to my relationship with any other species of animal frankly let alone in this particular ecosystem where the sets of relationships are entirely different. It, I think what it, I see it is doing is forcing a rereading of archival sources and taking seriously where you actually see those moments of things that aren't people bubbling up and being interpreted in ways that do create moral imaginations that are useful and then imagining how do we do that in the circumstances we live in and what does that mean here? Because it will not be the same. It's not about picking it up because if you pick it up and you just get the spiritual version, it, I mean, I, uh, it gives me the ickies in every, every possible way. It's colonially fraught yeah. and it's, I think it's ethically mm -hmm. basically bankrupt. There's no there there by the time you just decide that, you know, you're interpreting this. It's all fine. This. It's all, all, happy. Happy. all these right? animals it's, are dying for yeah. me. <laughs> so in fact, it's not universal and it's, it's mm -hmm. not going to just land in, in Providence, Rhode Island or anywhere else and solve our problems because we actually have to literally go do the work to figure that out. Mm -hmm. 
On this note, thank you so much to both of you. Let's thank our speakers.